a sure thing, sure thing. So, well, first question, how, how have you been? You look fantastic. I've been pretty good, um, but nothing compared to well, you. <laughs> well, I'm not interviewing you, but the question I want to know is, yeah, how long did you put the horn down? Over the summer, I put it down. It was almost eight weeks. And what was it like when you picked it up? You know, I questioned uh, a lot of things. Uh, thinking back on that, it's like, do I want to start into the same routine I'd been doing? Is it time to make a change? Is it time to do something different? And, and I did. And, you know, well, I found... Okay, you changed from what to what? Well, you know, a routine, of course, can become a rut, right? I mean, you can get stuck doing the yes. same thing every and I was doing almost the same thing every day but it was um, it was getting me where I needed to be you know and but taking that time away actually uh, helped a little bit of scar tissue heal and disappear from from the lip which you probably know a little bit about right <laughs> um, I've, I've had some of that and of course the Louis Armstrong book oh, oh right <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but uh, and of course I I knew him. Well, and, that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And Joe Glazer, his manager. Well, your manager too, right? He was my manager for a while. Well, um, you know what? That's a great place to start, Doc. Who's who was he managing first, you or Louis? Oh, Louis. Yeah. Uh, um, until he really got involved with Louis. He, um, I don't know, he, he had a car agency, he sold cars, and, and <laughs> I, I understand he had some serious mob connections. Wow. And uh, but he was always really good to me. Mm -hmm. I know that. How old were you, were you when uh, you guys met, or he became your, your agent? In New York, I was already doing the Tonight Show, and uh, so I put together a group of, uh, it's like a small chorus, well, not a small chorus. I had about 17 singers and nine or 10 instrumentalists. Wow. And uh, Joe Glazer's took it over. And uh, he, he sent us out on our first gigs. And he also was the go-to connection to play at the Plaza Hotel in New York. And he, and you know, I've, I had a couple really colorful conversations with him. <laughs> and he gave me a dog, one of his show dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you remember those conversations? What they what they were about, or what they were like? No. <laughs> well, and that's probably okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, if I if I remembered it, I'm very quick to forget it again. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, was he the one to introduce you to Louis, or had you already met Louis along the way? No. Um, <clears throat> I met uh, Joe first, and he decided to be my manager, mm -hmm. and um, he booked me into the Plaza Hotel, and I think it was the second time I played at the Plaza Hotel, um, Louis Armstrong came to see our show. Yeah. And uh, it was... It was quite an experience. I'll tell you. He got up and sang with us. You know, yeah, he, <laughs> he was really great that way. And uh, very colorful, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Did you guys become fast friends? Well, you know, he was very busy working and so was I. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really see Louis anymore after that until I went to his funeral. Oh, my. And, uh, you know, every trumpet player in New York was at that funeral. And it was, um, it was the kind of a thing, it wasn't a false thing where people thought, well, if I show up at his funeral, something, you know, somebody will say, hey, I saw so-and-so there, you know. Right, right. It was, it was for real. And the affection that other musicians and especially trumpet players had for Louis Armstrong. Um, you know, it was, I can't even describe it, what it was like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, if anybody says, what do you think's the biggest thing that ever happened in uh, modern day music business, I'd say Louis Armstrong. <laughs> and I, te I tell a lot of young kids when I go and play with high school bands or college bands or, you know, uh, uh, more mature groups were, were doing a jazz show. And I tell them, let's say, you know, and I've told many an audience too, the music we're about to play you would not exist today. And none of us would be here if it hadn't been for Louis Armstrong. That strong of an influence. Oh, boy, and how. And, you know, even when you could hear that his lip was kind of hurting him and all of that, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't about him being a, a great classical player, which he wasn't, you know. But I honestly don't think I can imagine where the world of modern music would have been without Louis Armstrong. Mm. I mean, that, that's just all there is to it. And, and he in, influenced uh, people like uh, Tony Bennett and yeah. uh, a lot of singers and... Uh, he was, that's, that's why I'm having such a ball reading that book, you know. Really. Well, you told, you told me on the phone the other day, you said you, you had a hard time focusing on it because a name would come up and you'd start thinking about, yeah. <laughs> just thinking about them. Um, so, I mean, of course, the connections in the music world, right? I mean, everybody was working with everybody else in New York, right? I mean, yeah. Is that kind of how it was? Well, yeah, if you're a freelancer, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And I was a freelancer until I had worked at NBC before and all of that stuff. And then when, when Johnny took over The Tonight Show, um, actually, they knew he was going to take it. No, it was when he took over The Tonight Show, I went back in the band. Skitch Henderson called me, said, and he called me Carl. He said, <laughs> Carl, you know, I'm going to be leading the band on the Tonight Show, and I want you to be there. I really need you to be there, and um, I don't think you'll be sorry, because <laughs> he, he had evidently talked to somebody there that had seen me in the days I was with Steve Allen and, and they were thinking, well, maybe this guy will have a line to offer here or there. I don't know. <laughs> and, well, uh, so, um, oh, anyway. Well, so I, I had forgotten that the, new, the uh, Tonight Show had started in New York. How many years uh, was it there before it moved out? I can't West? tell you, but I, all I can say is uh, the, there was no real television network. There was, uh, uh, I think, New, New York and four other cities 
were the only ones you knew that the show was going to be carried on. Mm -hmm. Like uh, New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, and something else, and something else, Los Angeles. And um, when Steve Allen had the show, every night he'd get a note, oh, guess what? Uh, Schenectady has come into our family, so hi to all you <laughs> folks in Schenectady. And uh, that went on for quite a while. Yeah, and, and then there was a network, and then uh, Jack Parr took the show over, and um, it continued to grow. And then when when Johnny took it over, it it blew the top the top right off of everything. Mm -hmm. So and Skitch brought you me, in. No, okay, go ahead. I had I I had seen Johnny work. Oh, on a Sunday Steve Allen uh, show, and um, Johnny came on and did a kind of a stand-up thing, and people didn't know who he was. And I, I don't know how much I knew about it, but what I saw there, like in five minutes or less, when people said, Johnny Carson, who is this guy? You think he's going to be okay? And I said, trust me, when I tell you, we're going to be more than okay. Because it was just something, some kind of a mist that came off of him that it was special, you know. And then he he's the boy of the Midwest. And that's where we had to score the biggest. Yeah. So you said Skitch brought you into the band originally. Yeah. Uh, and he, so how long did he lead it before you took that band over? Well, that particular band there, when Johnny was a host, I don't know, two or three years, it might've mm -hmm. been more for all I know, four or five. But, was it the same kind of format with, uh, you know, like a full big band trumpet sax oh, and trombones? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so were you, were you playing lead or the solo chair? What, what did he bring you in to do? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> Johnny uh, <laughs> uh, was, you know, I shouldn't say that because I, but this was after I started playing in the band and Skitch was the leader. Uh, occasionally, Johnny would play these super duper personal appearances, you know, in a place where you'd have uh, 25 or 30,000 people. Mm. And um, he asked me to come and, and uh, be his band leader. Mm -hmm. He didn't, somebody else did. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, so uh, that that was that. Um, that early band, uh, I mean, of course, you know, Tommy Newsom and those guys weren't there yet, right? I mean, you you eventually no, brought no, all those. Well, quite a few of them were already there. Skitch put that band together. Oh. And then, of course, when, let's see, when Jack Parr took the show over, Jose Mellis became the band director and um, there were mm, lots of changes. Mm -hmm. And then when Skitch had had the band, um, it was pretty much the same guys that had always worked with him, and that included me, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a good band too, right? What was that? It was a good band, right? I mean, it, it was oh, a good band. Oh, better believe it. Yeah. I told the guys when they came in, and, and I, wanna, I just want to tell you that the distance from where the first trumpet chair was, which I played first trumpet, down front where I directed the band from on those rare occasions when Skitch would. Skitch wanted me there mostly because he wanted to be able to go out and conduct symphony orchestras and do that kind of stuff. 
and he knew he was going to have to have somebody take over the band for mm -hmm. a little bit. And he knew Johnny would probably, uh, you know, would stump the band or something like that would <laughs> come to know me that way. But also that it would be easier for him to take off if he had me there. Right. And I'll never forget the first night that happened. It was a Friday night that we just finished the show. Skits were very flamboyant. He had his big overcoat over his shoulders, never put the arms, you know, just like a wrap. <laughs> right. And he gets to the door of the studio. He, he starts to go out. I was watching him and he turned around and says, oh, Carl, by the way, um, you have to take over the band here on Monday. Bye. <laughs> and I'm saying, but, 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 but. <laughs> so uh, did, did that, did that I, mean? I have no inkling of anything like that coming. Yeah. Uh, did, did he ever call you Doc at some point or was it Carl the whole time? Uh, mostly Carl. <laughs> uh, unless he was pissed off at me, then he might <laughs> <laughs> um, which didn't happen. Skits and I got along great. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I have to give him a great deal of credit because um, I forgot. I, I was uh, doing the, uh, gigs around New York and somebody called, said, I'm putting together a band for Skitch. I knew he. I knew he meant Skit Henderson. He said, mm -hmm. "We're going to play it at uh, Belmont Park, the racetrack. Mm -hmm. We got a some kind of a society gig out there, and he really wants you to come along and play first trumpet." And so, but before that, we'd been together on the Steve Allen show. Oh, okay. I didn't know and, that. And oh, yeah. And we had a long history together and, and a very good one. I've often said, if everybody would treat me as good as Skitch Henderson did, I'd never have anything to worry about. Wow. So um, thinking about uh, the difference between New York and LA, did you enjoy being one place more than another? Did it either musically or culturally? Oh, in the beginning, I, I was just desperate. I First of all, my family was in New Jersey, and I was very close with my, my family, my, mm -hmm. my missus and five kids. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I just didn't know what, what I was going to do. And uh, uh, by then, by the time the band actually, by the time we actually went out to the West Coast, I think I had taken over the band. Mm -hmm. And um, it was kind of a thing that, you know, I like to wake up two o'clock in the morning and go out and get a corned beef sandwich. <laughs> well, not in LA. I know. You, I want to be able to step outside of the hotel, walk a half a block and get my shoes shined. Yeah. No, not in LA. And there was a lot of talk back and forth about the style of bands and the players in LA was much more kind of laid back. They'd be talking about, oh, I had a barbecue in my yard on Sunday. So-and-so was there and so-and-so was there. And um, New York, it was, if, if you made it, into town for the gig and didn't get hijacked or something, you you know you were having a good day. I'm, I mean, I I actually had my car stolen out of a parking place where you go in, you pay him five dollars to park your car. I came back, no car. <laughs> they said, "Man, these things happen." And and. I, I was much more used to New York by the by the time we left New York and moved to L.A. Um, I, I, uh, I was 
kind of shook up. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about, I remember at a, one of the conferences, you were talking about the band and how you were putting people together in that group. And uh, uh, of course, Tommy Newsom and Snooky Young are the ones that, that to me stood out that I knew when I was watching um, the high profile ones. How, and I think you had mentioned that Tommy uh, was a tenor player, but you convinced him to play yeah. alto. No, I didn't convince him. <laughs> he was playing tenor in yeah. Skitch's band and uh, a very good tenor player. And when I did uh, club dates with them, jazz club dates, he was playing tenor. Mm. But when I played on Charlie Barnett's band and I heard the kind of lead alto that that Barnett would get when he would play with the section, mm -hmm. it was much more of a brass kind of a quality than a sax quality. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I'll never forget when I told Tommy, I, I'm, I'm gonna take over the band. I don't want you to, to, to be in band. He says, oh, great. Yeah, we'll have a good time. And I said, oh, there's one other thing. I want you to play lead alto. He says, why would you do that? I play tenor. I said, that's why. Because you're going to have to uh, change when you, if you put the air in, in an alto the way you do the tenor and, and you have a good stiff reed and, and, and a wide open lay, then that's the sound I want. I want that. Trumpets, trombones, saxes. I, I want that tone choir to be the same all the way through. Yeah. And, um, and he said, I don't know. I said, God, <laughs> come on, man. You know, if you hate it and don't want to do it, then we'll do something else. He says, well, I'm, okay, I'm here to try. <laughs> and, um, so it was, and it also gave an entirely different sound to the saxophone sections. It got the real, like a, uh, if you'd go to the, uh, the big ballroom up in Harlem um, and hear the, the sax sections there, you couldn't tell where the trumpets left off and the saxes began. Mm -hmm. it, it was just crammed in there tight mm -hmm. and there was an intensity to it that I wanted to have. Yeah. Who did you have and on I, lead trombone? I, knew I wanted that lead alto to sound like Johnny Hodges. Mm. So uh, who was your lead trombone? Do you remember? Mm. Yeah, I could see him as clear as day, but yeah. Um, but was, was he a carryover from Skitch's band to when you when you took it over? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I, I changed the band quite a bit. Oh, oh totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. Because none of the guys that I had had been with the, the Milton the Lug uh, band. Mm -hmm. I had a whole different band. Mm -hmm. And also, they had had some problems with uh, oh, other jobs that the band leader has to do, you know, like publishing and, and auditions and things like that. And uh, right. they, <laughs> Johnny's manager, Stan Irwin, wh whom I had known for quite a while, said, this band needs to be redone. And John is counting on you to come in and make the changes. Yeah. And I knew that wasn't going to be pretty, but, and boy, I did. It, it, but when you get on the other side like that, and it's, and the focus is on you, okay, now what are you going to do with this man? Are you going to fix it like I asked you to or not? 
<laughs> and I had a lot to do. And, well, he uh, seemed really happy with the band. I mean, you know, you watch the oh, show. Yeah. He, he was like the greatest, here's the greatest band in the land. Here's the world's greatest trumpet player. I mean, he seemed to be very, uh, very proud of that group. Oh, I, I really was. And I, I told the guys in the band when I took it over, I said, guys, I love all of you. And I'm going to tell you one thing. This is not going to be your typical New York or Los Angeles studio band. This isn't going to be about who's coming to your house for barbecue on Sunday afternoon or any of that. And um, there's going to be a lot of rehearsal going on. Mm -hmm. And we're going to play together. That much I can tell you for sure. Mm -hmm. And the guys are looking around like, <laughs> why all these <laughs> warnings? And they found out why. Because guys would come and do record dates and, and uh, television calls that were the guys who got the calls, had been getting them for years, and never practiced. And everybody knew everybody. Oh, yeah, Ross, well, great to see you. I said, that those days are over. I, I want this band to be really different. I, this is not going to be a studio band. And I told the guys, and I said, I'm going to be booking dates out, out of town. We need to go out and meet the people we're really playing for. Wow. And they were so surprised. We get into a town and bus would pull up to the hotel and some people might be there waiting for us and and they're they're running up talking to the guys in the band <laughs> that they didn't who are you? Well, I live here. I'm coming to your concert, you know. And <laughs> it was uh it was, it was an interesting time for all of us. Yeah. So how much did you rehearse the band? Every day uh, on a regular basis, regular time frame? It depended. If we didn't have a lot of acts that we had to play their music, and there were quite a few times that that was sort of the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as soon as they got through setting their shots and the stage was empty, I'd tell the guys, stay here. Oh, and they were gonna go across the street to the bar. <laughs> And I said, no, we're going to practice. And we're going to practice so we get it exactly the way I want it. And, um, you know, some of the guys didn't take well to it. But then they saw how different the band sounded. And I no sooner than got there, oh, well, maybe it was a year or so afterwards, a friend of mine, or it turned out to be a friend of mine up in um, Buffalo, New York, had a very uh, popular record label. Uh, I, I, I can't remember all the names of artists and everything, but I, I made records for them. And we were right in the middle of one of our artistic successes. <laughs> and he and he said, uh, "Come over here." He, we were in the studio. And he says, "I want you to forget about the date with the, your jazz group. Can you put the Tonight Show in a studio for me and record the Tonight Show band?" And I said, "Yeah, I can." And he said, well, I want you to do it. I said, yeah, but uh, you know, you're in, in the record business. Who am I to tell you the big bands don't sell anymore? Mm -hmm. He said, you know what? You just go in there, you pick out whatever tunes you want to do that could be associated with a big band. And I'll record it. You just let me handle the rest of it. And uh, 
I got a, a Grammy for the Tonight Show <laughs> for that first record. Yeah. And it wasn't, it was my least favorite of all of the records that we made with the Tonight Show band, but uh, it was, um, it was the beginning of uh, getting some attention for the guys in the band. And Johnny wanted to do that. He, he wanted to be able to call out names and, do them have new crazy stuff and and uh uh um, he you know the, we were on the air uh nationwide when they said we'd won the uh the grammy yeah and the guy that owned the company who had said look let me worry about selling the records <laughs> you just make the records. He gave me a check that was stunning. <laughs> Absolutely blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And and then we made several others, quite a few. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and all these names are starting to come back to me. And before I forget, I interviewed Rick Baptist yesterday and Rick says to tell you hello. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rick's a great guy. Yeah. A great player, too. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, uh, our, the interview went on almost two hours. <laughs> and it was, uh, the guy can talk, but it was one of the most enjoyable times I had had. And just the stories he had and, and the names he shared. But he was talking about John Audino and Snooky. Yeah. And, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking Ed Shaughnessy, of course, you know, all these guys that, that you brought into the, the band that made up this band that, uh, I don't know if they were part of the Grammy, that first Grammy. They but sure were. They were. Absolutely. Wow. How'd you find Ed Shaughnessy? Well, I knew Ed for years before all of this. When he was just a kid hanging out in the tavern where the musicians always used to go between dates. And um, I, I don't think he was even old enough to drink then, but he would <laughs> hang out there. And uh, I would started doing dates to, together where I was leader and he came out and played drums and uh, uh, for quite a while. I loved his oh, playing. Huh? I loved his playing. It, when, especially when you could see him, when the camera was where you could see him. I mean, it looked like he was having a great time back there. He, you know, the reason for that is because he was. <laughs> and um, he and Snooky Young were my two cops. When I would get new guys in the band, or if we were going out on a weekend and I had some strange people that I wasn't used to working with, Snooky Young and Eddie Shaughnessy would take these guys up to the side, say, uh, you know, you need to get a shoe shine and get your suit pressed while you're at it. And if they'd say <laughs> anything back, it'd say, you want to live to play another day? Do what I'm telling you, or you won't be around. And, and it took me a while to realize that they were so respected uh, by guys that I would be hiring mm -hmm. that if they said, uh, if Snooky or Shaughnessy said jump, they want to know how high. That was it. Wow. Um, how long, uh, and I don't know, this is maybe a silly question, but I'm just thinking, of course, you were leading that band for 30 years. Well, less but, than that, I think. But, but I'm curious, you know, was maybe there not. anybody? Maybe, no, it was 30 years, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So was there anybody that was there from the beginning to the end with you? Mm, probably a couple. Yeah, yeah. 
But of course, when, when we finished, uh, we left New York. It was a huge life change for me. I, I had to really convince myself that I could live in LA. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a wife and five kids. And my kids were all getting ready to, you know, some of them were graduating and, mm -hmm. and we were a close family and, and it was, it, it, it was very difficult move. I, I can see that as you're talking about, it, I can, I can see that it was a, it was a tough thing on everybody. Yeah, it sure was. Yeah. Um, take a little bit, a little bit of a left turn here. And of course, <laughs> I remember seeing you for the first time on the tonight show. My parents let me stay up, you know, to watch the, watch the, and, and it wasn't, it, didn't it used to be a 90 minute show? Wasn't it on for an hour and a half? Oh, it's for two a, hours to be Two hours. Yeah. Wow. But, you and, know, I'd stay up. Then it went to an hour and a half or so. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, of course, my first uh, image of you was in your very colorful clothing. <laughs> was that something that was part of you from even when you were freelancing in New York or playing with Charlie Barnett, or was that something that came about with the Tonight Show band? Well, part of it came from my childhood. Um, I, I lived in a small town, cowboys. I mean, real cowboys and real Indians. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was uh, a tough, it was a tough place to grow up playing a trumpet, <laughs> you know, and uh, so um, I was going to go up, this town won't mean anything, Condon, Oregon, had a 4th of July rodeo that went on for a couple of days, and my band director in school, Clyde Simpson, um, would have the band in these different towns, you know, like a half a dozen different rodeos and things like that. And uh, So he, he, he said, I, I want you to come up. I think, in fact, I think we were going to Condon for a, a big rodeo up there. And I told my mother about it, and I said, I want to have a real cowboy shirt to wear. <laughs> and she says, well, you're not a cowboy. I said, maybe I am. <laughs> of course, I, I was like, oh, eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, well, there's no store open in town now. Things were going downhill. Mm -hmm. so there's no place to go to buy a shirt. I'll make you one. My mom was a great sewer. Mm. And she got a bunch of fire engine red silk <laughs> and made this cowboy shirt out of red silk. And I saw it, it made a difference. Mm -hmm. It made a difference. At least it did inside of me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then I'll, I'll never forget, the, uh, I'd been hired, and Johnny didn't say anything about, you know, we'll cook up some kind of a thing for you to do where I can be sort of just saying, hi, how's that everybody in the band? You know, there'd be something there to talk about. Mm -hmm. There was never a conversation like that. He assumed that I'd been paying attention and <laughs> knew how it all went and you had to have those little things so I um <clears throat> in fact I was coming from I think I was coming from Joe Glazer's office back, back over to NBC and I went by um, a men's clothing store of just high-end Italian clothing and I saw some ties in the window. I thought, 
wow, those are something else. I knew I, I couldn't wear a blue suit. The guys in the band would have on the blue suits. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what I had on other than that, but I, I put that tie on. I, I didn't think that much about it. I didn't think it was all that crazy. Johnny came back out and the audience is applauding and, and he looks over and did a, about a triple take <laughs> at that tie and um, and said something and I said something and you know that's how that all got started and at the same time you had the uh, the trouble on college campuses you know mm -hmm. the it was a revolt against the way things ha had been and along came the Beatles and Everyone was wearing all these wild clothes and a lot of changes of lifestyle from people you would never expect it, myself included. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the way that tie went over, nobody came up and said, hey, that tie thing went good. You need to get a lot of ties like that. <laughs> but I didn't, I, I had been used to being in a band where I just wore the blue suit like all the other guys and the leader dressed like a peacock. And so I said, if it worked for all those band leaders, I'm gonna give it a shot. And, and you had the clothing revolution, you had the Beatles and all of that stuff and all like crazy styles. So uh, I, I um, started doing some very good shopping and and uh, I, I realized you know I could get away with stuff that I never would have dreamed I, I never would have dreamed and and uh, all of a sudden you know what the right as the coal beetles the clothing revolution the long hair the revolution on campuses, all that stuff was happening. Bam, I jumped right in there with it. Mm -hmm. And I found out that politically and other ways, I was right, I was in sync with how I really felt. Wow. And it became an expectation. Right? I mean, people would tune in, not just to yeah. hear Johnny, but to, oh. to see what you were wearing, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember after we had moved out to the coast, and I've been trying to buy, and I bought all my own clothes. And I just was worn out from trying to figure out what to wear. And I said, I told the guy that was my clothing guy would get my clothes pressed and get me dressed and on stage. I said, I'm just going to wear a blue suit tonight and a regular tie. He said, really? I said, yeah, who in the hell is going to pay any attention? No, nobody will even know it. And Johnny came out to do the monologue that night. And it was one of those nights when the, the guys didn't get the words on the teleprompter that were going to work for him. So it, right off, you know, he said something expecting a laugh and, and it was just a silence. And Johnny is standing there with egg on his face and he looks over at me and that's when he would have gone after me and I'm wearing a blue suit. And after the show, every night, the production staff would all gather in Johnny's dressing room. And, and they would have a heart-to-heart -heart talk about everything that went on that night. Johnny walked into his dressing room and all these people were following him. And he's pulling off his tie and, and he says, phew, geez, that was awful. And what the hell is it with Doc? Did you see that? He was wearing a blue suit? What the hell is that? Tell him that don't wear a goddamn blue suit anymore. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and the next, when I got to work the next day, I, the producer was headed my way and I saw this, this thing in his eyes. And uh, I said, um, stop right there. I'll never wear a blue suit again, ever. <laughs> he said, yeah, Johnny really, because Johnny was looking for, for some solace there someplace. And he was, you know, when he said, did you see him wearing a goddamn blue suit? And, 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 and the guys all on the production, yeah, I saw that too. And I, I wouldn't go to the meetings. I said, I'm, I'm not going there. That's not a place I want to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. <laughs> well, and let's, let's... when I started going out and doing concerts with colleges and high school bands, um, it's all the same. Uh, I'm there I'm in, on a stage with high school kids and a guy who's trying to decide if he wants to go back to college and take up something else or keep leading the students through whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. And the audience is going ape over, because I had to bring the clothes that I wore on the show. Sure. People I made it clear, no, we want, we want the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it was a part of my life from then on. Well, it still is. I, I didn't mind. I didn't mind. Um, you're still a cowboy at heart. Yeah. Well, yeah. And up until a few years ago, I was still riding quite a bit. And in fact, when I used to take my kids to the horse shows, and I'm talking about serious sort of shows like Madison Square Garden and mm -hmm. Big Time. Mm -hmm. And I watched my kids out there riding jumpers and doing, and I had one daughter who just did quarter horses and she was what they, what they call a trailer race. I mean, one day she's in uh, New Jersey and the next day she's in Minnesota. And, uh, I, I I just, I would see my kids riding in the shows. And then on, when I was home, we had 17 head of horses at one time. I got, I just go out and get a horse and get on a ride. And, and we didn't talk about showbiz at all. Everything was horses and horse shows cowboys the whole thing and um so i i said someday when it's when it's the time is right i'm going to do what they're doing <laughs> and so after the tonight show went off the air three months later i was in my first horse show and i uh, riding a jumping horse over the fences, and I won my my division. I had no idea. Does anybody yeah. know that, know about that? No. <laughs> I never talk about the times I stayed on a horse. I, it's all better when you can remember when you fell off because it'll keep your mind on your business. Right. Right. And. Uh, but that that was that was a big deal. Mm. Yeah. How long did you how long did you do that? How many shows do you, do you recall? How many years you did that? Oh. The horse the horse shows. Oh, from the time. Let's see. Twenty, twenty years something wow. like that, maybe wow. more. And I didn't get to go to all of the shows because I had to be. I, I couldn't go out and do a horse show with my kids. Right. And I, I there was never a horse for me to ride at home. <laughs> they, they had all the horses 
And my, my kids got up in the morning. We had 17 head of horses in the barn and they had to, the, the line to the bar, the water line to the barn was only down about that deep. And in upstate New York, you want to have it quite a bit deeper. And sure enough, the line froze. And for several weeks, my kids had to feed and water 17 head of horses twice a day, plus going to school. Wow. And uh, uh, I, I, I watched what it was doing for them. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to do that. And I didn't tell anybody that's what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And when I moved up to the Sandy Inez Valley, I found a, a really good teacher and a young married couple. And uh, I, I, wrote, I was on a horse right off the racetrack. <laughs> he, he, I looked at his papers and he'd been a racehorse in um, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. They have a pretty big time track there. And uh, all my kids, uh, out of my five kids, there was only one that didn't ride. She ran the barn. She knew every piece of equipment. What went, no, that doesn't go on that sort. That goes on that gray horse over there. Mm -hmm. And when she went to the horse show with my kids, she didn't, she never got out of the place where the horses were quartered. She didn't even know we were at our show. <laughs> and now she's a, a music person in, in Hollywood and has been very successful for, oh, about 30 years now. Well, is, is this Nancy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right, she's she the one that- the same with me. Uh, when I had this first vocal group that I had. Mm-hmm. And and uh, she she was yeah yeah well she uh, you told me that she was the one who was really uh, the the person that helped get these lost tapes out there and 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 put on a CD isn't that right the, that that uh, once Vinny told you about this didn't she well, actually get that? how that all started you know you know vince di martino well he was my first teacher okay yeah well yeah. I, I was up visiting with Vinny, or i was at his house for some to visit and he said hey i got something i want you to hear and he said some trumpet playing and puts it on and i said well, that sounds familiar. I, I don't know who that is. He said, that's you. I said, that is me? He said, yeah. And he explained to me that these tapes, you know how when a high school band or a college band does a concert, they always tape it. And um, there's some fairly significant amount of recording going on there. And then I got hooked up with Charles Fork down in uh, Texas and a couple of different towns he was in. And boy, when I walked in there and heard those bands, I said, I don't have to have music that's written for a high school band. I just decide what I want the piece to be like and who I want to write it. And if they say, what, you know, how good are these players? I say, just put the notes on the paper. It'll be all right. And uh, boy, that uh, was just uh, to, to suddenly be out doing that. And with an audience of people always sold out, that's what's he going to wear tonight? Right. <laughs> they weren't worried about what their kids were doing or any of it. <laughs> and uh, so I would wear something wild and um, Charles had all kinds of different things commissioned and, uh, boy, I miss that guy. Mm. And I, I want to tell you, I don't think he could teach a high school band nowadays. 
with the way things are. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. uh, the, the standard in Texas at that time was so high mm. that, uh, but Charles could, uh, he'd take whoever was there and get them to play things that I couldn't believe. Well, that I, I listened to that CD and the bands, <laughs> they sound terrific. I yeah. mean, just you, you wouldn't think first off that this is a, you know, a bunch of high school kids, right? I mean, this, yeah. this is like a really fine college band or, or better in some cases. But uh, I, I remember one of the, each year would, uh, some of the kids would still be there and some new kids. And Charles leans over to me in rehearsal and says, hey, Doc, get a load of that uh, little young girl that's playing the snare drum. And says, yeah, okay. And they're playing something that had some fancy snare drum thing. Mm -hmm. And he said, she can play. He says, she is stone deaf. Well, how did that work? I don't know. And I don't know that Charles could have told you either. But I, I had a close, close relationship when he was at uh, Robert E. Lee High School in, uh, what was that first town? I don't remember now, but uh, then he went up right outside of Dallas. And, uh, well, I'm tell you, <laughs> they, there was some fancy playing going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, and you know, one know what, what was really wild. If you walk in the band room any day of the week, well, except for Saturday or Sunday, unless mm -hmm. they had a gig they had to play, mm -hmm. any day of the week, and that band room was full. The kids went there to be with each other to do their homework. It was the center of their life. And Charles never let them down, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my life, I've never seen a guy do the things that he was able to accomplish. Wow. Because uh, the, all of the bands were not from uh, wealthy neighborhoods, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of them were kids that they didn't know where the next meal was coming from. Yeah. And uh, and I still hear from some of those kids. I see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it, it'll never change. I, mm. uh, uh, and, uh, and the guy that did the, um, the remastering of those tapes, he did a pretty good job. Have you got that record? I sure do. I, I got it from you at ITG last year in Miami. Uh, I didn't remember that. That well, that's okay. I did. I, you know, oh, and right, I listen. Right, I listened right. to him. I listened to him right away, and and uh, especially Billy. That was the one that you had really yeah uh, remarked about. And uh, yeah, it's a special tune. Very special. Oh yeah. 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 Um. Doc, I, I don't know if this, uh, I don't want to upset you. I'm, I'm curious, you know, we're all affected by Ryan Anthony's passing. Can, can, I, can I ask you about Ryan and the yeah. and, uh, relationship there and your thoughts on, on Ryan? A super gentleman. Mm -hmm. And I got the most beautiful letter from his father. Um, and um, um, the first time I met Ryan, he was with the, uh, you know, the brass quintet. The Canadian brass. Canadian brass. And I had a chance to introduce him to um, a woman that I was married to at the time. And, she was not easy to please. And when she met Ryan Anthony, she said, this, 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 this young guy is just remarkable. He and Jens were the two trumpets 
in right. the Canadian brass at that time. And um, it, uh, I can't put my finger on when it was that all these personalities gelled. But I couldn't wait to get to the next brass conference or whatever we were going to. Right. Uh, and we would get there and everybody, we looked each other up and, you know, it, it, it was love at first sight all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the playing was magnificent, you know. Yeah. But we, it's, we had re relationships that were way, way beyond normal. I mean, you know, I'll take a bullet for you. <laughs> wow. I mean, it was like that. And, mm -hmm. and when I heard from Ryan's dad the other day, it just tore me up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, uh, you it, still, are you still I'm, there? I'm still here. I'm, just, I'm listening. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I just uh, I emailed Nikki the other day just with a question and uh, you know I keep thinking about her and her kids hoping they're they're doing okay but uh, you know uh, doc uh, one a couple more questions just you especially when you talk about relationships um, that relationship with Johnny Carson you know that was that as close as it seemed from the other side of the the camera well, I think I think it was, yeah. I mean, you know, um, you asked that question in a kind of reserved way, and so I'm thinking, wow, uh, did he see something that wasn't real? No, Johnny was. Um, uh, and when some, like I never forget when Ed Shaughnessy's son was killed in a horrible accident. Yeah, Johnny was bam right there, and he wouldn't talk to you. Some of these guys maybe in God knows how long, and yet to him, it's like he really knew them, and he didn't hold anything back. And um, it was, um, did I answer what you wondered? Yeah, I, yes, you sure did. You know, and, and sometimes, and I asked that, you're right, it was kind of a reserved question because sometimes you wonder if Hollywood is what you see is what they want you to see or if it's what really existed. And yes, you just answered that. It's that In many cases, it's, what they want you to see and what they want you to think and feel. Mm -hmm. But um, Johnny ran his own show and, and he was the boss. And if you had a good relationship with Johnny, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's the same thing with my wife here, right? <laughs> whatever I'm doing right, I got to keep doing it. <laughs> well, hey, Relations are relationships are difficult, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't care what anybody says. Relationships aren't always a piece of cake, mm -hmm. and it's how you handle when things are not quite right. If if you don't hit the panic button and you remember who it is you're talking about and how you're behaving and all those things. Mm -hmm. Am I making any sense at all? Yes, sir. <laughs>